Um, so before I get into my game uh, or into my talk, just want to discuss why do we find inconsistencies in network games? Well, the primary culprit is latency, and that is the time it takes for messages to travel over the network. Therefore, if I press a key on my keyboard, there's going to be a short delay before you see the effects of that happening on your screen. So. In addition to latency, there's also jitter, which refers to the variability in latency. And there's also drop packets, meaning that some messages never arrive at all. And this is often collectively referred to as lag. So let's have a look at how inconsistencies show up in various games. So the first game we're going to look at is World of Warcraft. And here I am. I'm playing with my friend Jack. I'm controlling that purple gnome over on the left. And I start running, and you see my buddy Jack. He's tagging along behind me. And the game really does look pretty consistent. The thing is, when we suddenly have a closer look at what Jack's seeing, he sees himself running out in front of me on his screen, and I'm tagging along behind. So in this example, we've got a pretty big inconsistency. Fortunately, it doesn't matter a heck of a lot because the positions in this situation aren't really important. However, in games, there's other places where the positions of avatars are much more important. So we'll have a look at where there are some big issues with inconsistencies. <laughs> So our next example comes from the game Halo Reach. And in this game, we've got the two characters here. The character on the right is about to attack the character on the left. The problem is the true position of the character on the left is actually over here. So when we see the video, um, which I'll play in a second, um, the character will suddenly jump across the screen. And you'll see this first um, avatar do this stabbing animation with no victim in front of him. <coughs> Okay. Okay. And one of the most uh, recent examples of a game that had a lot of issues with consistency was Battlefield 4, which was released uh, uh, last year, or late this year. No, late last year. Um, so this is um, an example of one of the comments that was posted about the game up on Reddit. They say, the rubber banding lag seems to happen randomly. I can't even drive a vehicle because sometimes it just goes back and forth so much it drives me insane. So by rubber banding, what they're meaning is the vehicle goes ahead and then it gets pulled back to a previous position. And in the video, you'll just see how disturbing this would be if you were playing this game and trying to drive that vehicle. Okay, so I think we can see that dealing with inconsistencies in a game, it, it's a real problem that needs to be dealt with. Um, so we decided to conduct an investigation into techniques for repairing inconsistencies. So in our study, we addressed three questions. First, um, how noticeable and annoying are corrections in network games? Next, we looked at, do different game gameplay conditions affect a player's reaction to those corrections? And finally, we looked at what techniques might make the corrections less annoying for game players. So in our study, we developed a game which we called Space Rocket. Um, and the game involved two spaceships moving around in a 2D world. Um, uh, we had 18 participants who were regular game players. We got people who frequently played games, so they weren't going to be overwhelmed with the controls when they were um, doing our study. Um, so in the game, we synthetically generated um, inconsistencies and then repaired them. This allowed us to carefully control when and how they happened. And we varied the size of the inconsistencies and the different techniques we used to correct them. And also in the game, we had five different um, condi gameplay conditions that we looked at. So first we'll have just a little look at how the study was done. Um, so this is an example of one of the conditions that we call the coloring game, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. So the player was controlling the green spaceship and trying to color all the asteroids green while the pink ship was trying to color them pink. Um, when the player noticed um, a correction occur in the game, they were instructed to press the space bar, um, which popped up the following short questionnaire, um, and they would press a number key to indicate to what degree they thought that correction would have been annoying if it had occurred in a real video game that they were playing. Um, as you can see, the game is dimly um, 
uh, visible in the background, which allowed the player to maintain focus on the game while they were answering the survey question. Then as soon as the player pressed the number key, the game would just continue on playing right where they left off. So over our um, study um, with our 18 players and all the different conditions, there were 5,400 different corrections that occurred in the game. And we found that 25% of those corrections were rated by the participants as either very annoying or annoying. And a total of 50% of the corrections were actually detected by the player. Um, so we see that corrections, they, they are noticeable to the players in the games. So we wanted to see what it was about the corrections that made some of them more and less annoying. So what we wanted to look at first was the different gameplay conditions that would affect the player's reaction to corrections. And the first thing we thought about was distractions. If you had extra things going on in the game, would players be distracted and not notice that corrections were occurring? Um, so we had two conditions that had more and less distractions that we compared in order to study this. Um, so we'll have a look at the conditions. The first condition we called observing single. So what we wanted, we wanted the player to not be busy playing a game at all. They were just going to be looking at the screen. There was this one spaceship moving around. So this would give them the optimum choice for noticing that corrections um, were occurring and kind of give us a real baseline. Um, to compare with this, we had a second condition um, that we called observing many. Um, and again, we had the pink spaceship and corrections were all occurring to that pink spaceship but we added in this second green spaceship and a bunch of asteroids flying around that would potentially be a bit of a distraction to the player. So we found in fact all those extra distractions really made no difference. Um, we found no significant difference between the number of corrections or the degree of annoyance that the players found for those corrections in those two conditions. It seemed even though there was extra stuff going on, the player was able to focus um, directly on um, the pink spaceship and notice just as many corrections. So we decided to have a closer look at the player's locus of attention. That is, where the correction was occurring relative to where the player was truly paying attention on the screen. So we created um, four different conditions where the players were paying more or less attention to where the corrections were occurring. So I'm just going to kind of briefly go through what those four conditions were. The first one, we repeated what we just did in the first study, the observing many. So the player wasn't playing a game. They were able to completely 100% focus on where these corrections were occurring. Next, we had this coloring game um, where the players were trying to color the asteroids. Um, they were always controlling the green ship and trying to color the asteroids. So in the one condition, which we called controlling, the corrections happened to the ship that the player was controlling. So the player was really focusing on the ship they were controlling and the corrections happened to that. The other, time, the other condition, um, which we called the coloring condition, the corrections were happening to the ship that the player wasn't controlling and we really felt they would probably be paying very little attention to the corrections when they happened to that ship, even though they were told to be watching for these corrections. And then we created a fourth condition that was kind of in between those conditions. It was the shooting condition. And the player again was controlling the green ship, which you'll see is trying to shoot at the pink ship. Um, and the corrections were happening to the, green, the pink ship that was being targeted. Um, so the player would kind of be dividing their attention between the one they were controlling and the one they were aiming at. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through. So we've got two conditions, controlling, observing, where the player was paying almost all attention to where the corrections occurred, shooting where the attention was divided, and finally coloring where there was very little attention. So you don't really need to remember the names of the conditions, but the most attention, um, de the attention decreases as you go from left to right across the graph. So on the on the left where they were paying the most attention, um, they noticed almost twice as many corrections as they did when the correction was occurring off in their periphery um, and they weren't focusing all their attention. So this seemed to be a really important thing for how annoying or how many corrections people detected. 
Next thing we want to look at was um, gameplay. Um, does the act of actually playing a game affect the player, the way they react to the um, correction? Um, so what we compared was we had that observing condition where players were focused on the correction, and we also had the controlling condition where players were focused on the correction. The big difference between these two conditions in the controlling, they were playing a game. They were trying to um, hit these asteroids and color them, and corrections could um, you know, move them out of the way of actually scoring the points that they were trying to score, whereas in the other, they were just observing. Now in that observing condition, they were told to rate the corrections as though they were playing a game and try to think about how that correction would be if they were playing a game. So we weren't sure if we would see a difference or not. So these are the, the ratings that we got um, for the controlling condition where they were playing the game um, and the size of the bar there represents how many they found very annoying over on the right over to not annoying at all on the left. And this is in the observing condition. So we see there was a big shift um, in the number of corrections that were rated as not annoying when they weren't playing the game. And this is one of the quotes from one of the participants um, in the study. He said, in the first stage, and that would be the observing condition, um, you were rating it kind of like you were thinking you were playing a game, whereas in the later stage, um, you actually were playing a game. So when exactly the same thing happened, it was an awful lot worse. So we've looked at um, how some things that happen in a game um, affect uh, how annoying the corrections are. What we want to now look is what could we do as game developers to make corrections um, less annoying for game players. So there's several techniques we can use for error correction. There's warping, where as soon as you notice a correction, you jump to the um, new correct position. Um, or smooth corrections, where over time you progressively um, repair that error. Um, and you can do that in a couple ways. One, we just kind of move at a constant velocity to the new position, or we can do it a little bit more gradually, and I'll get into that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, so this would be how the warping correction would look. You've got your ship going, and boom, it jumps to the new position. With the smooth correction, the ship just kind of speeds up and slides into its new position. Um, and as expected, um, it really wasn't surprising at all that the smooth corrections were better than the warping. In all corrections, in all conditions, far fewer corrections were noticed when smooth corrections were used. And this was true even if we did that smooth correction over as little as 250 milliseconds. So it's possible to do the corrections even more smoothly. So when, when we did that smooth correction, the position changed very smoothly. There were no um, discontinuities, discontinuities, it didn't jump. But there was an instantaneous change in the velocity when the correction occurred. And possibly that sudden change in velocity of the ship could be um, noticeable. So what we wanted to find out, would the corrections be less noticeable if we were also did a smooth change in the velocity when we did the correction? This graph just sort of shows um, what we do. So we pick a time period over which we were going to get that inconsistency fixed, and we could just take the velocity of the ship, step it up, um, as the purple line shows, and back down, or we could ramp the velocity up. And in order to get the correction done in the same time, we'd actually have to have a higher um, correction velocity in the middle. Um, so it's possible maybe this higher velocity was more noticeable than doing the instantaneous change. We weren't too sure. Um, as it turned out, though, um, in all conditions, um, fewer corrections were detected when we did this gradually changing velocity. So it was better. Um, this just shows the difference um, for each condition. We've got, um, there, and there was a significant um, difference in all the conditions. Notice the, um, the difference in the controlling condition, though, was a lot bigger than in the other conditions. I'm kind of thinking maybe because you were actually controlling the ship, you'd just have that feel of the velocity changing more um, than when it was an object that was being controlled by someone else. Um, you might not recognize that sudden change in velocity. Okay. So the final thing we looked at was the correction detection limits. So the idea is we could do that correction over a longer and longer time period. And at some point, there'd be a time over which you could do that correction. You could do it slow enough that half the people would not notice that the correction occurred at all. Um, so how slowly do we need to perform the correction? We found the time you need to perform the correction, it depends a lot on um, 
how large the air was. A larger air, you had to do it uh, more slowly. If the air was twice as big, you pretty well had to do it twice as slow. So we sort of lumped all the different sizes together and looked at it in terms of the velocity of the ship. So what I'm showing here, um, on the, um, in the game, the ship traveled at about 12 centimeters per second on the screen. Um, and this is showing how much you could change the ship's velocity. So in the first three conditions where the player was paying some attention um, to the ship being corrected, you could add 50% to the ship's speed. Whereas in that coloring condition where it was off in the periphery, you could make radical changes to the ship's speed um, when you were doing your correction. So just in summary, we found that corrections, they are a real problem in video games, and we saw that players rated a significant number of them as annoying or very annoying. Um, one of the most significant factors um, in determining a player's ability to notice corrections was where they were focusing their uh, attention in the game. Um, and we found that smooth corrections were better than warping and that a gradually changing correction rate um, was better than using that constant correction rate. So when corrections are unavoidable, um, they should be formed as slowly as possible and using a gradually changing correction rate. Thank you.